stories don't define you. How you tell them will. Hi, I'm Sarah Elkins, your host and chief story maker of Elkins Consulting. When we share stories, whether in our personal or business lives, how we share them makes a difference in how we remember them and in how we're perceived by the people we're sharing them with. When you're listening to this podcast, I encourage you to listen and consider your own related stories. To listen and think about which stories in your life might have impacted you in a similar way. And think about how you share those stories and the messages they carry for you and for the people who are hearing them. Thank you for joining me, Brian. Um, your stories don't define you, how you tell them will podcast. I appreciate this. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited for it. <laughs> me too. Can you pronounce your full name for the for our listeners so that when they see it on the blog post, it's uh, it goes into their heads in the right pronunciation? Yeah. So despite the Y in my first name, it's pronounced just like an I. So it's Brian and my last name is Falchuk. Falchuk. And yeah. you're in Boston, right? I'm in the Boston area. Yeah, yeah. Did you grow up there? I did. I grew up right outside of Boston and um, I live in another town um, not far from the one I grew up in. So, you know, and I've I spent some time overseas and in different cities and traveled a lot for work, but I've kind of always been in, in New England, at least, um, including for college. So this is, this feels like home, you know, well, through wow. and through as long as I can remember. I can't believe you don't have an accent. That's just. I, yeah, <laughs> I definitely, I can, what we were saying before, like I can, if I have to. Um, you, know, if, <laughs> if you need to fit in somewhere. <laughs> yeah. If I need to fit in or, or maybe, uh, sound tougher than I actually am. And, uh, the, the accent can come out if it needs to. And I've, I've worked for, like my first boss had just the thickest, most stereotypical Boston accent and referred to individual people as the both of yous. The but, both um, of yous. <laughs> it's like, bang, get over here, the both of yous. And I'm looking around like, oh, there's two of me. Um, I was really obese then. So like maybe it's just because of my size, oh. but that's just how, it's just how I called individual people. Wow. And I'm, yeah, I weigh the same as I did in, I think, fifth grade. I'm not in fifth grade anymore. I'm Slightly past sixth grade now. Um, yeah, it was, it was a while ago. Anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I like by my biggest, I was um, about a hundred pounds more than I weigh right now. Wow. So yeah, very different. Wow. Well, I'm looking at you through video, but our listeners will only be able to hear the conversation. So I'll be sure and include an, a picker, picture of you. Um, on the blog post associated with the podcast so people can kind of get a better feel for what we're talking yeah, about. They won't get to see my shelter at home mohawk though. That's no. for a, uh, for a laugh right now. My son and I have matching mohawks because we all so need cool. a little bit of levity, right? Well, we're going to have to do a screenshot of this. <laughs> oh, no, I shouldn't have said anything. I did see a guy probably in his like mid to late sixties on Sunday, we went for a drive and there's a guy with a mohawk and like I, I pulled my hat off and like pointed, I was like, yeah, go like we're, I'm with you brother. <laughs> Oh, yours is too short, though. It has to it's be longer. The light. So well, the balding doesn't doesn't help. Oh. <laughs> well, the the mohawks that I remember from it's not the an eighties mohawk. Yes, no, it's yeah. not one of those. My first real boyfriend in college had a mohawk. He was kind of a smaller guy, probably five foot two, probably about my height, and um, he would use the aquanet and color and go upside down, and it was probably yeah. 14 inches that's tall. That's a process. The spikes. It was. Yeah. It was so cool. I, you know, he was kind of yeah, a bad boy. Cool. I think Your parents well must have loved that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, um, they were actually pretty mellow at that point because I had brought guys home from when I was in high school that were probably enough of a shock that my parents got used to it. Okay. <laughs> I always, um, I always found beauty in people that um, a lot of other people might not have seen beauty in. Well, that's really good. So and my probably parents got to see things excited. other people would overlook. <laughs> well, I remember, and actually I'm going to say his name. Um, one of my best friends in high school, we never actually dated, but my, one of my best friends is Mike Sugar. And um, he, I don't remember, he might've had a mohawk at some point, but he was kind of tough. He smoked cigarettes and drank beer. He was one of, he hung out with the stoners, but I don't think he was really a stoner himself, but that's kind of his got an awesome name to be doing Mike that. Sugar. Yeah, yeah. He was so cool. He's still really cool. He owns um, a tattoo, a couple tattoo shops in Colorado and oh, cool. just body piercing. He's, he's still really cool. But the irony was that I brought him home to shock my dad and, um, and it worked exactly the way I had intended. 
And when my dad pulled me aside to, you know, ask me about this guy, I told him ahead of time to go to our baby grand piano and start playing. And um, I said, when my dad tells me that we have to have a talk, give us to the count of 10 and then start playing on the piano. <laughs> and he goes, okay. So I guess I was kind of trying to teach my dad a lesson about um, judging people. Yeah. <laughs> so my dad pulls me into the kitchen and he's just about to give me a hard time about the guy that I brought home. And there's classical music, probably Tchaikovsky going in the um, other room on the baby grand piano. And I see my dad's ears perk up. What's that? <laughs> I said, that's Mike. And he goes, what? And I said, that's Mike, the guy I introduced you to. That's him playing on our piano. And he goes, oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the end of the conversation. Oh, that's great. So I like Mohawks. Nice. Anyway, we should probably get back to the, you know, the whole point of this conversation. It's a different show. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different show. So tell me, Brian, um, uh, just for the, for context for our listeners, um, just a, a brief description of what you do now, what your current um, position is and what you love about it. Yeah. Um, so my full-time thing is uh, speaking, coaching, and writing. Um, so I've, I'm working on my third book, um, but I try to help people overcome what they face and seize the opportunities that they have in, in a number of different contexts, whether that's as a leader or my latest book is about helping people with relationship dysfunction, which is so relevant right now because there are a lot of people who, you know, you're all stuck together. And if your relationship was rocky before, this is that pressure cooker. So how are you going to navigate that? Um, and uh, I would say I do a lot of speaking, but I was scheduled to do a lot of speaking. I'm not doing as much <laughs> of it at the moment. Um, that's okay. You know, it's the right answer. Um, but I, I do love engaging with groups of people, whether it's, you know, on stage or in a workshop setting or something like that, and just watching them sort of come alive from within themselves and see how something, some idea that I'm sharing speaks to a piece of them that's like, oh yeah, I understand this now. And um, it's like some people feel awkward with it. I love when people come up to me after a talk and they're in tears, because then mm -hmm. I know like I've, I've done something that that person will now change their life. Um, so I, if I was to sum up what I do, it's, I feel rewarded on a regular basis by helping people help themselves. Um, mm. so yeah, I'm really, really lucky with that. And otherwise I've been an insurance executive for like 20 years, which doesn't sound nearly as rewarding, but was an amazing career. And, um, I do some advising and consulting work for insurers and tech companies serving insurance companies. So two, two very different kind of self-help yeah. for individuals and for for companies wow i bet um things are really hopping in the insurance industry right now there's a lot of conversations going on that's for sure yeah there's yeah. a lot of unknowns and, yeah and there were already a lot of conversations going on about insurance every kind of insurance <clears throat> particularly of course healthcare, but also um i know that i've been seeing a lot on cybersecurity insurance yeah. and yeah just the way the world of insurance is shifting to more, um, more recognition of the, the real world around us and what that means for risk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, huh. That's also a whole other podcast, but yeah, I mean, that's, um, I'm, I'm really lucky to have been in some of the, the teams that created the current cyber insurance product. Um, so I got to see it, you know, from its genesis in like 2007, eight, um, when no one thought that was a product or there was any need for it, all of a sudden it's just kind of standard. <laughs> of um, course, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, watching, I, I ran claims for an insurer, so watching hacks and cyber events from the inside and seeing, you know, none of the stuff that makes the news, but to understand how these individuals work and the professionalism and structure, I mean, they actually will ask for referrals. Um, it's wild. Like that's a, I know a whole other topic, wow. but it's just, it's, it's fascinating. And to try to help people protect themselves if possible, and certainly recover if they couldn't protect themselves. Um, I think that's really rewarding and it's, um, fashionable to say insurance is boring or put insurance companies down, but I've been lucky to work with teams of, of people who really actually want to help individuals get their lives back together at the worst moments they face. Um, mm -hmm. and that's a, you know, it's really rewarding work. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, um, I, I usually ask 
my guests to share something about themselves that most people don't know at the beginning of the conversation. And I kind of missed that, but I was hoping that you would be able to share something that wouldn't be on your resume or LinkedIn profile, mostly because I, again, I like to give our listeners more context for the stories that they hear throughout the conversation. Yeah. Well, it's tricky because I do a lot of appearances on different shows and, and I'm pretty open um, across and I've written two books about my own experience. So I, I do share a lot. Um, yeah, something that people wouldn't know about me. Um, I, so I speak Mandarin Chinese, not that I use it at all anymore, but um, that for me, that was an interesting thing to go after. And it was like late nineties when I was in college that I chose to study it, you know, more formally. Um, and everyone's like, oh, and you're an econ major. So it's clearly like it's for business reasons and China's <laughs> opening up and like, yeah, there's all that. But actually the reason why I chose to study Chinese is since I was in sixth grade. So just after I reached the weight that I am now, um, uh-huh. <laughs> there's a, there's a little kid on my school bus who was always late to the bus and he speaks Chinese at home and this Chinese caretaker would bring him to the bus. And so he, it took him like four or five months but he taught me what he was going to say to her to have her bring him out to the bus earlier. And I mean, it's, it's silly, but as Mrs. Shu, can you get me to the little bus earlier? And like, <laughs> for whatever reason, the challenge of learning that um, and the intricacies of it really stuck with me from age like 12 um, wow. all the way through to college. And like, that's the real reason why I studied Chinese is like this nagging, um, almost like challenge out there. Um, now, luckily, I learned a lot faster when I got to college. It didn't need four months for a single, you know, fairly sentence. easy sentence. But um, yeah, it's, well, it's not, not something you had heard before. Like all of the sounds no. are different. So right. You had and so to it's pure change memorization. Change the shape of your mouth, even. Yeah. yeah. To be able to say those. Right. Um, and funny enough, like that's one of the few things I could still say without any trouble. And there's lots of other things that I would struggle <laughs> to remember the words for. But um, anyway, so that's the reason why I speak Chinese. It's not for uh, economic advantage or business skills or anything like that. I mean, that's a nice add on, but you were compelled. More about, I don't like being late. And <laughs> so it's really just about <laughs> timeliness. Um, and Mrs. Wow. Shu was really nice. She's a very nice lady. So that is so cool, her. Brian. I Maybe. love that. Well, it, because it actually speaks to a lot of what you do now and why you're compelled to do what you do now. And I, based on how you describe that situation, as much as you were compelled by the challenge of it, um, just from what I know of you in the last 15 minutes, what I've read about you online and the way that you describe that story, I really think a bigger part of being compelled was to connect with Mrs. Shu and the little boy. Yeah. As much as you loved the challenge of it, it was, you felt this, this strong connection to them and wanted to show them the respect of caring about their language. Yeah. I think um, at, at its core, that's really what everything that I do is about. Um, I was probably not savvy enough. I know I wasn't savvy enough in my understanding of myself and what drives me at that point. Um, but that is being able to, to relate to people um, in a really meaningful way is why I do everything that I do. And I share as openly as I do. And I also recognize like when I tell my story in my book of my own struggles, um, it'll resonate for lots of people. It's not going to resonate for everyone. And that's why I have my own podcast where I bring people on who have their own stories because Mm -hmm. if my intention is to try to get on the same level as someone so that that advice, that message sparks something in them to be better, to do better, to overcome, to stop, you know, struggling in the ways that they feel they are. um, Sometimes it does take that really genuine equal footing kind of resonating story. Um, And I can't do that for everyone. So what language can I adopt from someone else's story? to help that listener. Right, right. I think about that a lot in terms of um, even every episode, like every episode we record, uh, it's not my favorite episode. Um, There are some that I definitely love and I put Mm -hmm. it out there and I think, oh, this is really going to resonate with people and, and crickets, you know, I don't hear anything. And then I, I share one that I didn't find particularly inspiring and I hear from listeners, oh my gosh, I loved that one. That was so great. And yeah. 
it's that reminder that we are not our own audience all the time. Yeah. I don't know if really we well I think we're rarely our own audience. Yeah. Yeah. I just I try to I try to listen for if that person's story comes out with the power and truth that moved them, whether mm-hmm. it resonates with me or not. And if there's if there's that truth in it, then I know, you know, even if it's one person, it's worth it. Um I just got finished interviewing someone that sometimes um I don't like doing things back to back because I never know how much I'm going to get moved by a story. And it was uplifting, but also very heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've had an hour between the two. So hopefully I'm, I'm good. But um, yeah, I mean, there's even if the person's life isn't ours and everyone's experience is different and they're not better or worse or tougher or easier or whatever, it's your life is your life. Um, it can still move us if we're willing to connect with it. But yeah, mm-hmm. we can't guess what someone else is going to connect with or not. So we just right. do our best and bring it out. Right, exactly. And we have and that's the thing is that we have to be okay with what we're putting out there. Yeah. And and just trust in that. Yeah. yeah. I realized that um even when I was when I first started singing professionally and I wouldn't like the way a sound a sound came out or, you know, a certain song and gosh, I kind of sang a little flat on that or whatever. And people be like, Oh, that was my favorite tonight. And <laughs> I'd be puzzled. Like, were you in the same room that I was in? Cause, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, and I think it's really, you can't do it for the sake of your own. Well, you have to do it for the sake of your own desire to do it. Cause you're not going to necessarily get feedback. Yeah. But um, at the same time, recognizing that limitation is mm-hmm. important. Yeah. So, well said. Thanks. So I, I have a couple of questions for you based on the beginning of this conversation. Um, You mentioned that you decided in uh, college to learn Mandarin Chinese, to take that class. And do you remember kind of starting that process and putting it together even then that it was meaningful to you, not just for the challenge? But I'm imagining you going into that class and having had a little bit of, of um, exposure to the sounds in comparison yeah. to some of the other students in class. Do you remember that class? Uh, yeah, definitely. And it was an 8 a.m., five-day-a-week class. So I, oh. I never had the, like, sleep-in college experience. Um, and we had a test every Monday. So even, like, Sundays were intense. Um, I, you know, w- there were actually a few Chinese folks in the in the class. So, like, they grew up with Chinese parents hearing Chinese. So I was not, you know, by any stretch – the most like accustomed to any of it. Um, I actually felt like I was the most behind in that respect, but um, I, I grew up, um, I mentioned before we were recording, like my dad's South American. So I didn't just grow up with English. I spoke Spanish before English. Um, So I've always had an easier time thinking fluidly in multiple languages. Um, there's like sometimes I'll struggle. So like I was in China during college. I went for a summer and um, I befriended these guys from Spain and they spoke <laughs> to me in Spanish because they didn't speak Chinese. Um, I couldn't respond to them in Spanish. I understood them fine. They also spoke English. So I would respond in English, but I couldn't, it's like my second languages. I couldn't intertwine them. So I had to fall back to my mother tongue. Wow. Um, it's really, it's just interesting to me that like, Luckily, they understood English, but like I knew I had no problem understanding them in Spanish. I just couldn't get my brain to come back to them in Spanish. Switch that gear because you were in yeah. China. And all day I'm speaking Chinese. So it's, it's an interesting thing. And I stuttered when I was a little kid. That's why I actually stopped speaking Spanish for like from age three on because um, I had to speak English because we lived here and I had to uh-huh. go to school. Um, so there's something in my brain that has a little bit of a struggle with like not hearing and comprehending. I did that fine. It was the communicating side of it. Um, but I really, I enjoyed the different sounds. I enjoyed the musicality of it. Um, there's a lot of story behind the Chinese language. There's a, and I mean, the characters as well, like there's an evolution to the traditional Chinese and they really were like little pictograms for the words and and then to understand how those pictograms evolved into the the modern day characters. Um, I just found that fascinating. And like you said, like you're just memorizing sounds. You're not putting together letters in an alphabet to create sounds. 
So it's like you can sound something out all day and in English, you'll come up with the word eventually or Spanish or any other, you know, romance language or alphabet based language. But in Chinese, like sound from now into eternity, you're still not going to come up with the word unless you happen to hit it. Um, (laughs) That's really interesting. But it also means understanding the story behind the words is your best bet to learning the language. And so I felt like there's just so much beauty in that. And it's so different from any language experience I'd had before. Um, it really did switch something on. So challenge, you know, that's one word for it, but it's really um, is a mental engagement that I had not been able to get through any other language arts kind of experience. Right. And the curiosity. Behind yeah. It. And there's that. like, there's an art in it. And just like art and story in learning how to speak a language, which, you know, like I speak Spanish, it's a beautiful language. There's musicality to that as well, but it's still not the same as like the character is literally a story about what that word means. It's just really right. fascinating to me. Yeah, I cannot get this image out of my head of you standing, trying to talk to these um, Spanish speakers in China. Yeah. And I, I had, as soon as you said that, I had this image of um, one of those um, brainwave tools, you know, the, some sort of measure yeah. that they could put the things on your head and, and watch the way that your brain processed the oh, language coming really to you <laughs> and the, the, the process in your brain of not being able to translate yeah. Spanish to speak back to them. Yeah. Like I'm just, I imagine I there'd be like a flash on the screen. Cause yeah. I, f- I felt incredibly frustrated. It was almost like yeah. my brain is overheating right now and it's like, does not compute. And, and it's like, I know the words. Like, right. how could I listen to, and when we were in a club, like it was loud and I'm doing fine, you know, like there, it was not a perfect right. environment. And it's just like, there's this like rusty gear that's just frozen in my brain. And, like, <laughs> and the funny thing, when I, was, when I was learning Chinese, I would do that. If I didn't know the word in Chinese, I would sub in the Spanish which is just, I don't know, like, like thinking like, okay, well, it's not English, so that's better. Like that's less wrong than if I just use the English word in class. <laughs> well, you were what, 21, 22? I was like 18 or 19. 18, yeah, this is the first better. year, but, um, yeah. and, but it would happen without a thought. Like it would right. just, I would naturally, not Chinglish, it was like Chanish. I don't know what you combine <laughs> Spanish and Chinese into a language. But yeah, I mean, it, um, it's weird. Like I, I wasn't choosing to do that. Or not consciously. My brain was inserting these things. Same thing with responding in English. Like I wasn't, I wanted to respond in Spanish and I couldn't. I would love to see the images of your brain, of a person's brain when they are translating those languages and and the frustration that's involved. That is so cool. Really cool. This is definitely (laughs) not something I've ever talked about before. So this is a, this is a first. (laughs) <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. You just never know what's going to happen on this podcast. <laughs> so now um, I have this image of you and doing this language and choosing economics. What was the, the time in your life, the particular incident that took you from, I'm loving my, my work in insurance to, I need to write this book and help others have this awakening. What was the awakening? I mean, what yeah. happened? Um, so in 2011, um, I, I mean, as a bit of backstory, like I've struggled with anxiety for as long as I have memory, um, sparked by my parents' divorce when I was really young. That's why I gained weight, um, trying to quell that instability inside of me, that sense that everything's falling apart. And as a little kid, you can't do anything about that. Um, and my parents, A, had their hands full with the divorce, B, had their hands full with three other kids as well, because I was the youngest of four. And C, it's not like I was going up to them and being like, oh, you know, I'm feeling a bit unsettled about this situation. I'd like to discuss okay. it with you. Like I didn't, I was four or five. So I just so went you're probably eight. picking up and picking up permanent markers and writing on things that you shouldn't. And I mean, probably, that's what my kids Yeah, said like my skin. Things were weird. If, yeah. Well, so yeah. permanent markers were all scented back then and- being that I loved eating, I probably just had a lot of color around my nose from smelling them <laughs> and thinking about like whatever candy that they were eliciting. Um, no, but like you I, fed I just, your stress. yeah, you constantly, fed your stress. constantly, constantly. And because I was eating out of an emotional hunger and because food does not 
solve emotional hunger or, or satisfy it. I was always hungry. Phys- physical hunger, I have no idea what that feels like. Um, I have more recently learned what that's like, but <laughs> back then I, I just didn't, that was never an issue and I had so much reserves on me. Um, so with that backstory, I never really did anything about it. Um, the upside is I was super self-reliant and driven and I fixed problems. Like I would jump in and solve. That's why I was studying economics and stuff is I'm like, you got to make money and you got to take care of things and, you know, be responsible. Um, so I, I was like, I got things done and that served me really well. It also led me to fight doing anything about my anxiety because my anxiety is why I'm still around. Is protecting me. It's made me really capable. Uh It's made me successful. I had a great career. I was a management consultant, which means I was paid to find what was going wrong and fix it. Like I was paid to have anxiety. Um, (laughs) Right, of course. But just recognize other people's anxiety and absorb it. Yeah. Right. Um, Because you're empathetic as well. Yeah, only it didn't come off that way. It came off as like, you know, sensing problems and kind of flipping out to jump on them and like, get out of the way. I'm trying to fix this. You're just getting in the way. Or, um, all well intentioned. Like but yeah. Um, but that, that's more what the issue is, is um, it, it's not, it's not an enjoyable way to be. It's certainly not enjoyable to be around. And 2011, um, I was married, still married, um, but I was married uh, pretty early in our marriage at that point. Um, five years in, we had a, just over two year old and my wife got really sick. Um, Mm. and, uh, she started wasting away. She's in excruciating pain, lots of other symptoms and the doctors couldn't figure anything out. Couldn't do anything for her. Were extremely dismissive. Um, and it got to a point where she weighed about a hundred pounds. She was losing two pounds every day. And her doctor called me on June 30th, 2011 to tell me he was going on a six week vacation and he checked in. (sighs) when he was back and I was just like, doctor, do the math. She's not going to be here in six weeks. Like she can't keep losing weight like this. There's not going to be anyone left. She's bedridden at this point. And he just goes, okay, we'll take her to the ER if you need to. And he hung up. What an asshole. Um, Yeah, for sure. Um, But then I had to walk back into our bedroom and our son was at the foot of the bed looking at his mom, essentially dying in front of his eyes. And when he turned and looked back at me, that, that was it. That's, um, and that's when I had to face my own issues because like I I was doing everything around the house and taking care of the two of them. Um, but I wasn't standing with her because I was so overcome with the anxiety of the situation and like trying to fix it, trying to fix it and feeling powerless to do so. And I'm about to be a single dad and a widower when I thought we were just starting our family together. And I mean, I was 32, like not something I would have contemplated then. And I'm also working full time. And luckily I was able to work from home. Um, you know, I, I, my boss gave me like a month of flexibility so we could find someone to help. And, but um, I was freaking out. I mean, it's like everything hitting me and Um, she just needs someone to slow down and just sit with her and, and be afraid with her so that that fear can be validated and play out before just being like, you got to do this. You got to do this. And the doctor said, use that. And why are you? Uh, Cause I'm like, fix, 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 fix. And then my son's like, daddy, can you read to me? Cause he's two. And I'm like, no, I have to make dinner and I got to do this. And it like all my issues growing up feeling like things aren't going to be okay. Of course, he's facing the exact same thing, probably stronger than I ever would have faced because he's watching the loss of his mother. And the one parent he has who's around is not pausing to just give him that sense that things are okay. And it, all of this hit me in that moment. It was like, I'm failing them. I can't save her life, but I'm not helping her do that. She just needs someone to be there with her. And I love that little boy more than anything. And if I just want to know that he can be happy, it's not going to be with his only parent being this. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that was crushing for me as a parent. What I wasn't ready to do was recognize like, it's not good for me either. Like I actually, because I didn't feel like I deserved happiness or because like, this is who I am and people depend on me and that's a good thing. Um, And I don't have to be miserable. 
And there's lots of ways to get things done without being like this whirlwind of fix it and like anxiety. Um, that took me another six years to get oh. just enough self-love to make myself my why. Um, but my son, my son and my wife were enough and uh, she's still alive today through her own hands. And I stood by her better than I had before, but I, I hurt her very deeply in that process, just making her feel like I was part of that chorus of people who wasn't listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I changed in an instant. So when I woke up the next morning, it was like the end of the day, I woke up the next morning, I'm like, I'm still feeling this. And I felt empowered and clarity before, um, but nothing like this. And if I don't pause and figure out what this is about and how do I ensure that this feeling survives, um, this is probably my last chance to do that. And then that little boy is not just watching one of his parents die, he's watching both of them die, just one's at a slower rate. Um, and that, that was this moment where this idea that I called to a day for me was born. And it's a totally different way to look at my life without like this constant sense of all of the baggage from yesterday, whether it's like things I regret or things I feel pain over, you know, what I experienced or even just things that were great, but I don't have anymore. And so I long for them. And thing I really was stuck on was tomorrow. Like all of those what ifs, like all the things we're all feeling right now, like how long is this going to go on for? And will I have my job? And will I get sick? And, Mm -hmm. you know, is my wife going to live? And all of it. um, I constantly was living with yesterday and tomorrow, completely sitting on my chest unable to breathe. And that's how I took every moment. And it's like, none of those things is happening right now. And I don't know what will or won't happen in the future. And that's a really hard truth to come to when you're whirling with anxiety, because it seems so certain. But you would not still be standing today if your anxiety was always right. Like the number of times that I was like, this is, you know, so many exams, (laughs) you know, college students are like, oh, I'm going to fail this exam. And it's like, everything's over. I can never write this paper. Or, you know, you get fired from a job and what's going to happen now? Um, You know, fast forward, it's hard to see that in the moment, but like, you don't know what's going to happen next. And at some point you have to recognize, like every time you told yourself that was the end, the fact that you're still debating whether that was the end means it wasn't. <laughs> exactly. You know, all those times you were so certain you're not good enough. It's not going to work out. You can't do this. You did something because you're still here. And you have to start to take that evidence to recognize like it's not tomorrow. It's not yesterday. It's only right now, always. So the choices we make in this present moment, that's all we have. And the sum total of those choices are what either moves our life ahead and makes those terrible things that we are so certain are going to happen, not happen, or it puts Mm -hmm. us in a position to cope with them better and stronger and move through them in a way that we wouldn't if we just sat here cowering. So tell me, Brian, what did you do? What was the first thing you did when you got up that morning? Because you obviously have a very vivid, clear memory of those, those 24, 48 hours. Yeah. Um, So there were three things that were right in front of me that I was already aware of, but refused to do anything about. So I had lost a hundred pounds, but I gained back about 50 of it at that point. I I wasn't obese anymore, but it's like American. I just looked like everybody else, but (laughs) yeah, but I wasn't healthy, you know, a few pounds every year. And it's just like, that's what happens. Dad bod. Um, And uh, so I was like, this can't be like, I, I don't feel good physically. I'd had back surgery a couple of years before. My back hurt every day. And I'm like, none of this is all right. And I had all the tools from the first time I lost weight. I got really fit. Like I know what to do. I just don't have like the desire to do it. So I need to have that desire and I need direction and structure. And I'm going to, I was 222. I'm going to get to 185 by the end of the year. So July 1st to December 31st. Um, And I mapped it out and I built a spreadsheet because that's what I do. My best friend's name is Excel. (laughs) But I needed that because I needed to know in each of these present moments, am I doing it or am I not doing it? Am I, because like when you lose a hundred pounds, you don't lose a hundred pounds today. You don't lose a hundred pounds over a couple of days. Like it's every day you do something that puts you further towards that goal. And it can be still be daunting after a week of, you know, really busting it at the gym. Like you still have 97 pounds to go. Like, I'll tell you, that's about the same. It's, it's the crushing. long game. It's yeah. The long game. It's totally right. the long game. It's like going on a hike. You don't step to the top of the mountain. 
it's a series right. of steps. And so what does each one of those steps need to look like? So that was number one. Number two is this anxiety thing is like enough excuses about how I don't have time or money or whatever to go talk to someone. Cause I kept looking at like, how am I going to make 50 appointments with a therapist work? I don't have to, I just need to make this one work. Right. <laughs> and I will figure out no whether I, yeah. So I just need to have a bunch of single appointments and one at a time. And um, my wife was really supportive of that. And of course now was even worse timing to do that, but it was that much more necessary. I think it's even more important to do it when it's, you're yeah, a caregiver. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But it was like all of my excuses about like, you know, I can't leave during the day at work and now I can't leave at night. Right. I can't see someone after hours. Um, you know, and how are we going to afford it? Well, now we have all these medical bills mounting. So it's right. like all of my standard excuses of why I can't, were just mm -hmm. elevated. Of and it's like, great. And we're just going to make this one work. And then the third one was there were some things going on at work. Um, the company was really changing. The founder had passed away. The new CEO was great, but just very culturally different, uh, much more political. And um, it's just not me. I don't really care for that. So I have a lot of respect for him. It's just not where I would do best. So mm -hmm. I need to start, you know, networking and, and doing some things to plant the seed because that was going to be a long game um, to try to move on. So those are three things. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I did all of them. I didn't get to my weight goal by the end of the year. I got there in October. So, you know, it was wow. ahead of schedule. Um, <laughs> wow. By the end of the year, I, I got to 180 and I've basically been there since that was 2011. Like my weight's Nathan. plus or minus three pounds. Like I'm 176 today. Um, wow. and I do weigh myself every day, but it's for completely the opposite reason. It's in case I'm not eating enough. Uh, so I just yeah. want to make sure like, I, cause, like if I'm 183, I don't care. I have all right. the tools and I have all the, the direction and motivation. It'll get where it needs to be. Right. But there's a couple of times where I've gone under 170, which is just too light for me. Too it's small, like, okay, what's, right. go, what's going on? Am I burning too hard? Am I pushing myself too much? Should I rest? Oh, so that um, makes so much sense that that's your check-in. Yeah. For your emotional well being. Yeah. You're checking your weight is really a good cue for your emotional well being. It's a well -being. holistic read on my body. Yeah. My emotional, my physical. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's so funny to me because the scale was like the scary thing about being too high and it was always too high and it was only going up. And now it's like, I posted one day, I was like, I was 169 today and someone was like, awesome, you can keep, keep doing it. And I'm like, no, like you don't understand. <laughs> Oh, I'm six foot two. Oh, like, yeah, no. let's not. Ooh. I was marathon okay. training. So the point was like, I need to eat more. Right. It's really simple. Charged. It's not like, yeah, I'd be like, right. you can do 150. It's like, I hope not. God forbid. Um, that would but that's society, different. right? It's like, right. ooh, thinner's better. Like, no, no, no. No. Can I ask you, um, my first thought about your wife was celiac? But no, um, although she eats like she has celiac. She has Lyme disease, um, chronic oh, Lyme disease. Oh my gosh, which, that was my next guess. Yeah, as soon as I say that, um, probably half the audience tunes out on a lot of shows. They're like, oh, that's not real. That's oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I, I, mean, have, that's all. I think one of the, the worst symptoms of that Lyme disease, other than the fact that it comes and goes and you can't necessarily <clears throat> predict when you're going to have symptoms. Yeah. But I think one of the worst is the, the um, emotional degradation that happens periodically. And it's yeah. not all the time. Yeah. But I have a friend who suffers from it. And there she'll be fine for weeks even months at a time and then all of a sudden she will get angry and um, unpredictable and her emotional health just tanks yeah and that's her husband actually after eight years of this he recognizes it as soon as it starts and he's like honey this is what's going on mm. this is what we know we need to do you're gonna it's gonna take a few days but remember this is only temporary mm. And that's he how they address awesome. it. Yeah. He, well, they, they're an well, awesome and she, couple. She must but. be if, if he has the right to, to do that. Because um, when you're in the throes of it, that's a really hard thing to take. So that speaks yeah. to their relationship and the freedom mm -hmm. and respect mm -hmm. that they have. Well, I can tell you that that has even changed in my relationship with my husband. We're going on 23 years on oh. May 31st. Congratulations. Which, Thank you, which also happens to be the day my first book is going to be available. Congratulations um, on that, That's my too. launch date. Thank you. Um, but it's interesting that you say that about the relationship, because I think what you talked about, your third book is about relationships. That, and my second when is book. That? My your third one's book. about insurance. Oh, 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 dear. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. I'll read the first two. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. 
but when we talk about relationships and being able to say those things in the throes yeah. of things, um, so I realized when our, our older son is 21 now, when he was in fourth grade, he went through this really hard time where every afternoon he'd get home from school and he would like lose his mind. He would be mm. the sweetest, sweetest kid in the world, get home from school. We'd be doing homework together because I was in a master's program at the time. And he would just lose his mind and throw this big tantrum. I can't do it. I'm too stupid. And I realized that eventually I realized it was because he couldn't, his body wasn't controlling his sugar levels properly. Yeah. And that's an 11 year old thing, by the yeah. way, yeah. almost every boy I know <laughs> goes through that at about 11 years old, which is great. Cause I've been able to warn my friends who have younger kids than me, but my son's um, 11. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, here you go. So yeah. here's the thing is um, at that point I could, I would say, Jacob, I need you to eat this banana. And he'd be like, no, I'm not hungry. And he'd you yeah. know, scream at me. I'm like, I need you to eat this right now. You know? And he'd, he'd, kind of growl at me and then he'd take a bite of it and then I'd say take another bite and he'd take another bite but I was a parent right so I could force yes. him to do that to a certain extent it wasn't until about two years later when he was 13 and we were practicing for his bar mitzvah and I brought him a, a snack to his bedroom and I said Jacob I need you to eat this right now he goes oh I'm not hungry because he hadn't tanked yet yeah. and I said I need you to just take a bite I know you're not hungry right now but I need you to just take a bite so he took a bite and then we had this conversation. I said, you know, um, a couple of years ago, we both noticed that when your sugar level drops, you tank and your, your brain shuts down and your amygdala takes over and you get mm. angry and you can't control any of your emotions. I said, so I need you to start paying attention to when that begins to happen. Mm. And if you don't notice, and I do, I need to be able to tell you without you freaking out on me. Yeah. Yeah. And we had this amazing conversation and our cue was like faking, picking my nose or, you know, something that only a boy would get faking yeah. a fart, right? Yeah. Whatever it was, um, I would give him that cue when he would start to tank, I'd be like, you yeah, know, making a fart sound out of my elbow yeah. and he'd start laughing and I'd hand him food and he would eat it. Yeah. And the same thing in the last five years of my marriage, I've been able to, when my husband has a comment for me about our music, because we play music together, and he gives me some criticism about the song that I just sang. And at first, I used to get really defensive, especially if my low, I had low blood sugar, or I yeah. was stressed out, and I'm trying to practice anyway. And he'd be like, well, you know, that would have been better if, and I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think, I don't know, is it age? Is it the choice? Is it that moment where you can say, I love you, and this is why I'm giving you this feedback? I wouldn't yeah. bother if it yeah. didn't matter. I don't know. What, I mean, this is in your second book, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I th so I think there's a couple of dynamics that I think are really important to understand in the situation. And one is all the history behind the present moment, whether that's the history the two of you have um, or the history that person has. And specifically, like, what was their upbringing? Is there trauma in it? what does criticism and feedback and being wrong look like in their family? So I've, you know, I've worked mm -hmm. with people who like being wrong was dangerous. You know, you would right. get beaten for it. And so for you to point something out to them, no matter the context you put it in, no matter the intention, no matter what else is going on because of their early childhood experience, which was extreme, they will go into that defensive kind of right. spot understandably. Right. And it has nothing to do with you. Um, so it's important to understand that context. Um, the, the other and the main theme of the book, it's, uh, I think it's a great book with a terrible title, but it's the 50, 75, 100 solution, build better relationships. And the, it's about our share of You're the problem. I know, right? <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, I don't want to do math. Like, no, there's no math in it. It's just like, look, we all think relationships are 50, 50, you know, it's like adversarial, oh, but they're, um, not. Yeah. they're not. And so if it's 50, 50 in one view to get to a hundred percent better, actually it's, it's 75 and it's that you own your half, but you also have influence over half of the other person. So a half of a half, another quarter, there's right, your 75, okay. 25 and 50. Um, I'm and picking it's up that, what you're dropping off. <laughs> there's a, there's a picture that explains the whole, like I had to, I had to draw right. a map. Um, <laughs> But the idea is your behavior becomes the basis for that person's reactions. 
if you, and it's all actually founded on some Buddhist principles, if you give them a different version of yourself to interact with, whether they want to or not, they are going to react in a different way. So recognizing that you suddenly feel that you have agency in this relationship dynamic that's not working well, whereas you might have felt helpless before because you saw it as 50-50. You're like, well, that's all them and they just need to or right. when will they or I wish they would. It doesn't work that way. So what if doing something within yourself and taking that level of responsibility actually empowers you to help make it better? That's the basis for these moments is seeing like you have to appeal to what the person wants. It's called happiness seeking. So if you can understand like in that moment, they don't want to be told they didn't sing well or they're acting out or whatever. What is it they actually want? And if you can connect to that, you're much more likely to get them to see what it is you're trying to say for how you're trying for what you're trying to say and not the spin that they're putting on it because of their back context. Right, where you know right. you're being compassionate, but to them that's a threat. And so then when they tell the story, it's like, and you came in, you're like, you need to do this. Like, no, I said, sweetie, I love you. Would you, would you mind? Or would could we? Right. Yeah. And it's like, you are throwing things. And I'm like, what? Um, do we need to get like surveillance? <laughs> I'm not saying this is me. I'm, you know, asking for a friend. Right. Um, oh no, I, I've been there. We've all been <laughs> 23 there. years. Yeah, no, we've all been. And, the, and to be fair, it's not, the book is not just about romantic relationships, spouses or, you know, significant others, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's any relationship, whether that's parent, child or siblings. I mean, siblings, like there was a nine and 10 year old or whatever version of you too, that even though you're right. now in your forties, like those little kids are still part of that backstory. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's just even random people, you will never even know their name. But, you know, I talk about this situation in traffic, um, especially around Boston. Like we've all been cut off in traffic. We understand, well, that person didn't get on the highway to cut you off. It's not about right. you. And when you recognize like their happiness that morning was not like, well, where's Brian's car so I can get in front of it. That would make me happy. It's like, no, I want to get where I'm going. <laughs> right. Just same uh -huh. as you. Yeah. We both want to get yeah. where we're going. And they happen to make a decision about being in front of you that to them was like, I just want to get one car ahead without thinking like, and that means they're going to get one car back. It's not about right. you. So yeah. if you can recognize that you're less reactionary and then you have a better sense of what to appeal to, to get the right sort of response out of them. Yeah. Oh, that's a perfect example. I, I had that conversation early on in my relationship with my husband. We were living in Washington, DC where um, somebody cut us off. And I said, um, so you, this guy cutting you off is going to ruin your whole day. Yep. You're going to choose to have your day ruined by some guy that doesn't even know who you are or that he even did anything that pissed you off yeah. <laughs> and you're going to let it ruin your whole day. And I remember that conversation so vividly because then I owned it, you know, by saying it out loud to him, I was like, Oh, I've done that before. I have yeah. to, I have to we get that have. too. Yeah. yeah. We can't let them win. Like we have to get back in front of them. It's like, well, now well, how do you think they're going to respond? Right. Um, I love the example because it's super tangible and anyone who's driven has dealt with it. And uh -huh. it is very tit for tat. Like they may not know they cut you off, but as soon as you cut them off, they still may not know they cut you off. But now they're like, what's this person doing? I'm going to get in front of right. them and you're just going to get right. in an accident or, um, and, and you, you don't know what their story anger is. Building up. Yeah. yeah. And, and usually it's, I, I think it has more to do with, um, the whole idea of personifying a person, giving them some yeah. uh, emotion or experience that they don't have. Like he knew what he was doing in some way. And yeah. yeah. Brian, this has been um, all kinds of amazing. It's been all over the place of amazing. <laughs> We've yeah. been all over the place. But it's been fun. It has been fun. It's been a great conversation. And I am so grateful that you reached out. And I think it was um, Jonathan Sr. Jonathan Sr. that introduced us because yeah. of Funk Quest. Yes. Um, and, and that uh, second season is going, and I'm on it at some point. So that's kind I am of too. Hopefully we'll meet in some sort of finals. The, oh, the, that would be awesome. The woman I went against last time was the overall winner. So oh, you, should, you should want to come up against me. It works out really well. <laughs> well, and he wanted us to meet each other because yes. of a science experiment that um, I told him I found in my refrigerator. And oh, he said, gosh, oh, Brian yeah. Falchuk, you'll appreciate this. So yeah. I don't know what that was about, but I will greatly um, appreciate. I don't know why he, I'm vegan. So I don't know if he thought that that, that 
would especially bother me. I don't, I don't know. Maybe he just thought you had a good sense of humor and that that kind of thing would make you. Uh, that's nice of him. I like And you Jonathan. have an 11 year old son. So I do. My guess is that you're going to have some kitchen experiments going on. If you we, yeah, already. we, we just might. <laughs> and I, yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll leave it at that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brian. This has been a pleasure. And for our listeners, I will include links to his three books and to uh, his LinkedIn profile so you can connect with him there if you'd like to, and also to his website so that if you happen to be planning an event virtual or in person over the next two years or so, um, please feel free to reach out to him. And thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Your Stories Don't Define You, How You Tell Them Will. If you're planning an event or company retreat and want to bring in a memorable, entertaining, and highly practical speaker as your keynote speaker or workshop facilitator, please visit us at elkinsconsulting.com to learn how we can help and provide a memorable keynote or breakout session. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Could you tell me that?